Graciela with us today. Um, he's at the M Enabling Conference along with Deborah, so they're co-presenting from uh, the hotel room. Um, we've got Antonio. Um, are you in Cork today? Or are you yes, I'm in Cork. International jet setting again. Uh, I'm, I'm in Cork. We are on. Uh, there's a marathon happening in the city. It's a bank holiday. And, but the, we are under a, a weather uh, alert, weather alert. We are on orange, yeah. so it's not not is a is a, a great day to stay at home with tea and scones. Okay, yeah, first day of summer and it's the heating's on and it's freezing cold over here. So you're probably doing better than we are. So anyway, we're really glad to have you on, Mike. Uh, you've been doing this business for longer than pretty much anyone, and um, I, I know you've been. Uh, effectively a founding father of the web accessibility movement, so we're really, uh, really pleased to have you on um, and talk about the work that your your group do. The Patello group do some fantastic work. We see some of that, and also we regularly see what the individuals who work within the group are contributing to web accessibility and the conversations around that. So. Um, they're effectively like the traveling Wilburys of the accessibility world, you know, quite a few accessibility rock stars, not that I'm calling them all aging because Carl Groves will kick my ass. Um, <laughs> so, um, and we don't want the Viking doing that. So um, really welcome. Thank you for, for Thank taking you. the time. It's great. It's great to be here. Uh, um, always happy to uh, share, uh, you know, thoughts and in, in, in our passion. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that um, TPG has been very very fortunate that we have a lot of good friends who have uh, pulled together and bonded together for many many years on behalf of technology and people with disabilities and we're just as committed as we've ever been even for for many of us who started our careers as fledglings uh, trying to figure out what accessibility even meant. I I, I think once you've started down this path you don't escape. <laughs> I, I think that's very true. Uh, people often ask me how I got into this business in the first place, mm -hmm. and it really was kind of this uh, accidental tourist type of, of, of notion. I um, was working as a technical writer at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, a company that doesn't even exist uh, you know, today, but back then was the second largest software company in the world next to IBM, and uh, was asked to just take up some work involving some Braille documentation to deliver it to the National Braille Press down in Boston. And uh, at the same time, I happened to be working in the very first um, notions of markup language long be before HTML was even thought of, or before Tim Bursley uh, uh, was on the scene. This is back in the early 80s. And um, that got me down the path of, of figuring out how to work with markup languages and um, accessible documentation for the print disabled. Okay. So, um and, and you've also done work on 508, and you've you know, continued to you know, put out some amazing stuff as well. Uh, I use one of your tools all the time, and that's the color contrast uh, yes. tool, um, you know, which is a gift to the world. It's fantastic. So um, tell us a bit more about um, TPG and, and, and you know, how, how you've changed over the last 15 plus years, because it's, mm. it's, it's a, a long standing. Um, organization, certainly in terms of maturity within the accessibility world, which is relatively short-lived. Yeah, uh, well, well, TPG actually, this is my third company. Um, before that, I had WebAble. Before that, I had uh, something called Casiello Group uh, Accessibility Services. But, but TPG, um, uh, we uh, built in 2002, so we're you know what 13, 14 years into into the company as it is right now. Um, I had always positioned the company uh, from two perspectives, and one of them might be surprising to you. One is, or, or one that I don't say might be surprising to you. Uh, one was I always wanted to be in the professional services and the consulting business. I felt that um, my skills and uh, the folks that I originally started the company with, we were better positioned to do the consulting and professional services um, above and beyond the uh, subject matter expert uh, um, uh, notion and offer those to clients. We weren't software developers uh, per se. We all had software backgrounds and application development background, but none of us were really tool developers or application developers. So I really didn't want to go, go down the path of developing a, a tool. Plus, I, you know, I was aware of, of things that were already being 
already being done in, in the industry. Secondarily, I really didn't want to get involved in, uh, not get involved in, but uh, really did not position the company as a web accessibility company, which surprises a lot of people. Um, even though, in fact, today, probably, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the business that we actually do is a web or digital property or internet based property of one, one form or another. That's just circumstances. That's just the way it's, you know, the digital economy is. Um, I've always wanted to build, and we have a very strong software accessibility company. So um, while you hear an awful lot of what we do in the web uh, arena, in fact, there's not a software platform that we don't work on. Uh, going all the way back to IBM platform, uh, mainframe platforms and working, working with uh, applications built in that, in that environment. So you've got mobile, we've got cloud. Um, you know, we've got PCs, we've got Apple, it, it doesn't matter. If it's software and there's an accessibility concern, we're on it. Okay. I, I think that that's reflective of most people. The web is public, the closed ecosystems that people see within their own organizations doesn't get the kind of publicity that, that the web does. Um, I spend an awful lot of time myself working in enterprise environments where um, the work is a on software systems that are that are closed off to the general public, but it's right. an awful lot of work there, um, yeah. and and you know, they go way back. There's an awful lot of legacy systems out there too that right. I'm sure you'll you know, share the pain of working on. Um, no, there's never any pain. No, there's never no. pain. It's all it's 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 it, it is a it is a proverbial shot in the arm, but it's a good shot. Yeah. Okay, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think the you know the the web is the web is really interesting, but I think that actually enterprise is also somewhere that 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 needs the oxygen of publicity. The the fact is that without people doing the work in an enterprise environment, people can't work. People don't have access to jobs. So although access to information over the internet is hugely important and as more organizations go browser based uh, in terms of their tools and everything else it will continue to your 60 to 70 percent will probably become 80 to 90 percent you've still got this core of, of, of stuff that without which people could not work so I think it's really important to to, to understand the the Weight of import of, of 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 some of this work and it and and to talk about it because it doesn't get talked about because it's effectively closed shop. So I, I, I know you've got clients that 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 you work with and I don't particularly want you to bring out the particular clients, but you could tell us a bit about some of the stuff that you do in enterprise. That would be really interesting. Sure. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think maybe one of the big drawbacks to to the business that we're in is that we are essentially in the compliance mm -hmm. you know, business and, and, and as such, um, uh, you know, you basically sign your life over to your to your clients and in and, and NDAs and legal mm -hmm. things. So it, it would be very, very um, fair to say that most of our clients are Fortune 100, Fortune 500 clients. Um, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, very large government sectors, federal, <clears throat> European, um, uh, you know, educational uh, sectors as well. So you've got public and private sectors that we're working. But uh, at the at the at the enterprise level, uh, most of it seems to fall into two buckets in terms of just industry at large um, and where they're going in the financial industry, the travel industry. Uh, some of it is just in the pure software. Uh, enterprise level uh, industry um, and education in, in, in what they're doing um, in, a, in a number of different areas, especially because they're, they're uh, reaching out. You've, you've got the widespread notion of the MOOCs that are out there. So uh, that's creating a much larger network and enterprise environment. Um, in our involvement, generally, I think probably this is true for most of the colleagues in the field who, who work in this usually it starts with pain, as you as you aptly described it, and that is uh, there's some legal aspect associated with it, and uh, therefore there's requirements around how do we how do we enhance this environment for for people with disabilities, um, and so so we'll start there, uh, but we will usually again like anything else we'll usually take it from 
uh, front to back, so to speak. And uh, we, we, we talk an awful lot um, about accessibility uh, modeling and uh, an accessibility maturity model and end-to-end -end accessibility uh, in, those, in those environments. The, the, the whole notion of, of enterprise computing, even in a proprietary uh, environment, uh, where I think a lot of the biggest challenges are, uh, involves the personalization aspect of, of, of the users and what needs to be done at that level. Now, the nice aspect of that is so much of what's being done is not unlike uh, a, um, a, a CMS, a content management system environment, um, where you're developing uh, a lot of templates in, in the background. Uh, in this case, you've got personas that address various disability types, um, and we're able to even take in some edge cases and, and weave in some of the accessibility at that level. Um, the biggest challenge I think that we have is that we often are bottlenecked into one or two areas of the enterprise instead of the whole complete system. And that makes it a little bit more difficult um, uh, to work with because we really want to be involved uh, from an you know from an end to end standpoint. Yeah. I think I think that's that's always the the balance that you'll have and it's tricky where as consultants, you'll get invited in to work on discrete projects, those pain points as you, you, you were talking about. Um, I sit within an enterprise and, and, and with a small part of a much bigger organization which is delivering IT services. And so we're always trying to do that whole holistic end-to-end um, -end process all the way through. And it's not without its difficulty, let me, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you, but it's not. Um, but the, the whole premise is looking at the maturity models and everything else. And I think maturity models are the way to go. I'm a big fan of the Business Disability Forum, of which I'm a member and, and contributor. And I'm hoping that um, the maturity models get greater traction and adoption. I know that um, that SSB have been, been using them. I, I think that it's important from my point of view that it's not just technical. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think that one of the things I like about the, uh, the business disability forums model is that it's also talking about organizational maturity in terms of people, in terms of organizational process as well. Because whilst we may be delivering technology, everybody, you know, we're, we're delivering technology for people and then, you know, and for their working lives, and we've got to consider all of those other aspects as well. Right, right. I I, I really like an approach that. Sarah Horton and David Sloan mm -hmm. um, have pulled together, and in fact, we just re returned, as you as you probably are aware, from the Web for All conference, yeah. in which uh, they presented a paper on accessibility in practice, which is a type of accessibility maturity model that the two of them have pulled together. We've been very very successful with that. In fact, that paper won uh, one of the awards at that particular conference. And Sarah and David have been going around. They, they, they've got at least two or three uh, more presentations to give, and then another one at the Budapest conference, the AAATE conference, uh, later on in, in September. So this is, uh, I, I agree with you. I think this, this notion of you know, building accessibility top to bottom, inside out, um, uh, so, so that it's holistic and in, 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 in walks across the breadth and the and, and the width of, of, of an environment or in as you said an enterprise um, uh, environment uh, is 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 really the key to corporations. I would suggest that with the impending um, five weight refresh and perhaps more profoundly so the update here in the states to the Americans with Disabilities Act for Title II um, organizations, which is functionally public um, organizations, and then the follow-on to private, which would be industry, I would suggest that um, corporations and industry and education and public offices really look closely at the accessibility maturity models and start to indoctrinate them now before those things require them to spend lots and lots and lots of money later on yes. under the old remediation notion. Yeah. No, no. Pennies, uh, pennies spent up front, so pounds later. Absolutely. So, right. Um, and and also, 
through maturity models, you can devolve responsibility. So I think some of the stuff that um, actually Jamie Knight, who we were talking about earlier, has been doing for Gareth Ford Williams at the BBC was uh, looking at building champions within the organization. They're not necessarily um, dedicated accessibility people, but they're people that um, have the responsibility to be thinking about it within mm. the organization, thinking about it within the projects, thinking about it within the context of their roles and what they're delivering for the organization. Because I don't think, especially when you get to large organizations and you're talking Fortune 100 organizations and and so on and so forth, and I'm working within one that's 100,000 and we deliver to customers that have over 100,000, you can't do it all yourself. Right, right, right. So, so you have to devolve the responsibility, so you have to find ways of, of, of um, infusing people and, and put in place those kind of mechanisms. Um, it's, a, it's a long, long road. I'll tell you what, though, it's, it's, it's a, and I'm sure you agree, it's a worthwhile road when you get organizations to buy into it. Yes. And right now, we've got three or four. Uh, you may have heard last week, for example, um, the University of Colorado at Boulder okay. uh, in the United States had been um, under uh, um, the auspices of the, of the Department of Justice here. Uh, TPG has been working with them for a year, and that has been based on that very program that Sarah and David have pulled together. And we were, sh frankly, we were shocked because we were all in Florence at the time when we got the news from their um, uh, from their staff at, there at, at um, David Jones, I think, uh, at at the University of Colorado. And the Department of Justice said things are great, things are going. Great. They they pulled the inquiry. And it was really, from our standpoint, we've had a lot of little successes. That's a big one because that's a campus-wide ADA. It was it was more than just software and technology. It was a lot more than that. And uh, that university committed everything that they had, from the provost all the way down, uh, CIO, CTO, uh, chief accessibility officer. Everyone was involved. It, it, it really is a is, it's a great story, and we're we're really proud to be part of it. That's, that's, those are the kind of good things we want to talk about. Oh, and no. the media is really picking up on that, too. Yeah, yeah. That's a really, really big win. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing in the United States that more and more litigation is happening and more I mean, significant litigation is happening, and the DOJ is stepping in. And for, that's a huge win. Yeah. I was reading about that. Yeah. For the DOJ to back, say, okay, you got it, and to back away, we've never seen that happen. Yeah, that's the first one. I mean, I'm, it may have happened before, but it was the first one yeah. that I knew where the Department of Justice had put in an inquiry. I'm aware of quite a few of them, as, aware, as you might imagine. It's the first time I've seen them go back and say, you guys followed through on the plan and uh, you're acting on it. We're seeing significant progress. We're, we're, we're gonna let you move forward. And I'll also say, we're also seeing the opposite happen. Companies that were actually, ha that have been sued before are now starting to be sued again. And there's um, a company I won't mention that's about to hit the media that it's not gonna be good for their brand. So it, this is not something that's going away. It, it, it's it, as you were saying, go ahead and do it now. Start adopting it now. Build it into the processes. So it's yeah. very, very important. Yeah. I'm also interested. You, you, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dave, by the way, um, since he was at Dundee. So, um, congratulations on snaffling another great talent. Um, oh, is that David Sloan? Yes. Yes. Yeah. David and I have been good friends for many years. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, congratulations! You you picked up another one along with Lee Abney and Henny, and, and you know, you're gradually picking them off. Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't work my, that way. Honestly, no, I know. it really doesn't. It may seem like that, but it, <laughs> I, I I'm telling you, it's it's just like it's just like uh, uh, you know Google groups or whatever. It's a circle of friends. We've all known each other, and I've just been very very frankly lucky that um, we have enough business that we can bring people on. And we have a culture in the company uh, that puts people and family first, and that's that's the way we've always been, and that's why we've had a very strong loyalty. Um, I think we've only lost two people in 15 years wow. who left on their own. Okay, so you're not building a patio group um, desktop. No. No. Okay. So um, that's never been the intent. 
<laughs> Never been the intent. Okay, I know Antonio. Tell you a story about that sometime. <laughs> Ant Antonio's got a couple of questions, I think. Sure. So, uh, Mike, so far we've been talking about, about accessibility in the corporate world, but in terms of the shared economy and apps like uh, Uber and Airbnb, how, how are they looking to accessibility? Are they in contact with the leaders in the space, or they are just trying to figure out that by themselves? It's, it's a good question, Antonio. I, honestly, I'm not sure if they're working with the um, disability and accessibility community. I'm sure that um, some, of the, some of my colleagues may be involved and in, in, in touch with either one at least from a technology standpoint, uh, but they haven't been in touch with TPG. I, I, I think the shared economy has a lot of benefits to it and could be incredibly useful to people with disabilities in general. However, it too will come with its own challenges. If you're a blind person and you make a call uh, for you know, an Uber call, how do you know when they're there? How do they know who you are, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, social recognition that just takes place that we kind of take for granted. If you're um, an Airbnb client or, or a host, how do you ensure that um, your facilities are, are accessible, you know, for example, to a person in a wheelchair? So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there for us to work in a number of different spaces and in something I, I, I guess uh, on TPG side we should give a little bit more attention to. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mike. Yeah, uh, and uh, over the over the uh, after uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, I decided to go and, and look to some uh, data uh, analytics about uh, topics related with accessibility and try to relate them with the event itself. And I I, I realized that there are a few hot points I would say it where uh, searches and people are actually talking about accessibility. And they end up being, you know, um, Canada, Ottawa, T Toronto, Austin, Washington, Lon London, Singapore, and Australia. You have recently, uh, you're recently in Italy. So uh, how do you see uh, all this? Because sometimes I have the idea that there's a common, some place in the world where this topic is no. People talk a lot about it, but there are in other in other sides of the world, uh, people are not that public in the way how they talk about accessibility. Yeah, again, that's an excellent observation, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would, I would bet that the areas where it's hot, as you described it, are probably the result of legal mandates. Uh, that are in place. You mentioned Canada, so you've got the AOTA Act. In the United States, you've got four, five, six different, um, uh, you know, uh, pieces of, of legal mandates and legislation. Um, in in Australia, same thing. Uh, there have been some movement in Singapore, some in South Korea. In Italy, ironically enough, we we did get to meet with a couple of the folks there. Um, apparently, under the last administration of the uh, prime minister there, um, I think someone who would prefer to remain nameless at this point in time in his, his life, um, there was actually quite a bit of um, energy behind accessibility. But in the last couple of years, that's kind of dwindled back. The economy has had its effect on it. Um, so it, it wasn't as big. I think in Europe in general, um, I find that accessibility comes in two flavors. One, research there is second to none. It really is second to none. It's one of the reasons why when I go to conferences, I, I go to Europe because the, the fantastic research that goes on there. And I get to listen to a lot of, again, friends and colleagues who have done work there. But secondarily, the social system and the health system um, in the structures that are set up in Europe are done in such a way that it doesn't, from my perspective, of course, I'm only speaking from 
you know, the narrow-minded perspective of a capitalist here in the United States. Um, it's, it's, it is like it's treated like health care. And uh, there's not as much innovation. The innovation doesn't ma- match up with the research. Um, and, and so I, you won't hear about it as much. It doesn't, it doesn't take on. There's some great people. I mean, if you think about the people who work for TPG, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Steve Faulkner's, the Jez Lemons. Uh, um, uh, I almost said someone I didn't want to say. David Sloan, as you mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Um, you know, we've got some great people. Uh, that are working with us. Uh, Patrick Alok is with us. Henny Swan is here with me in Washington, D.C. You know, they make up a, a poker hand just in themselves, you know, with how great they are. Mike, but, but I don't see, I don't see the, I don't see, I don't see the, uh, I don't see the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit there. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just the political and social systems the way that they are. How many people are at? The Pasiello Group now. Um, we're we're just about thirty, just about thirty. We're going to add a, probably another half a dozen in the next couple of weeks. Wow! Wow! Um, okay. So we're pretty excited about that. We, I really wanted to try and cap the growth, to be honest with you, um, but demand, which is a good thing, uh, is forcing us to 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 get a little bit larger. And and how are you how are you doing that? Because obviously it's a it's a fairly small pond that we're fishing in. Um, you know, you've you've taken some of the big fish already. So uh, are you developing skills? Um, something that I've had to do where we've we've set up an academy scheme. And we're training apprentices in in accessibility because we find it hard to recruit. Yeah. So is that something? Yeah, no, that you, you just think? touch on you just touch on something that's very important. So I'll, I'll capture both of your your okay. uh, questions. Uh, first of all, we no longer recruit. Um, I used to do that, and I kind of I got kind of caught up with uh, finding people who really didn't have the deep technical and software skill sets that we need. And TPG has grown a new part of its business, something that I've been working on for several years. And, and thank, thankfully, with Sarah and Henny and David particularly, we have this whole accessible user experience group now that has taken on a life of its own. And it's just been phenomenal uh, what they've been able to accomplish. So people now come to TPG. Um, we will put out notices now and then and let folks know that we're hiring, but, but we're very, very particular about who we bring on now. The second part of what you said, though, uh, Neil, I think is even more important and more vital. Organizations like IAP and others are, are trying to do this, and that is we are closely associated and aligned with universities in developing internships. In fact, we have a couple things going on that are active right now because we feel very strongly that if we can organically grow uh, with younger blood, so to speak, um, and teach them um, what, as I think is fair to say, some of the world's best experts in the world that work for us under their mentorship, which we have a very strong mentorship a program in the company uh, that will develop more uh, Leonie Watsons and Steve Faulkner's and Hans Hillens of the world. And that's, that's our goal. That, that's fantastic because as far as I know, your organization and mine are so far the only ones that are doing that. And we've got young people because if, if we look at the, uh, the, the survey uh, run by WebAIM, the demographic is way too old. Right. You know, we're yeah. going to need that younger generation to support us in our dotage. Um, so, so, so we better start now. I'm, I'm being selfish here, making sure that uh, 
got someone to look after my needs because other people <laughs> might be. Well, um, well, listen, you know, some great work is being done by organizations like Project Possibility. Okay. Uh, Stanley Lamb, uh, uh, you know, uh, started that up back in California at CSUN. Um, and, and now the SS12 competition that also goes on. And in fact, that's where, uh, for, for, for a TPG standpoint, that's where we're getting some of these students because they're already working voluntarily on projects involving information and communication technologies for people with disabilities. So you're hoping that you can grab some of the passion there and show them there is a profession uh, in a future that they can go for. Yeah. So, so again, agree with all of that. And we're trying to put a structure in, especially in the context of our, our large organization. Very interested in what you call AUX, what I call IUX, inclusive, accessible, what's in the name. I think it's really important because actually as someone with a cognitive disability, it's an area that's not had the focus that it's deserved. Um, the accessibility, user, usability crossover is massive. Um, yeah. Deborah and I are members of the the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. I've spent time today looking at maths techniques. I hate maths, but that's why I'm doing it. Um, how do you see um, accessibility going forward? Because it's it's been very technical. I think what you're talking about with Henny and, and others is bringing some different... They have technical skills, but they're also soft skills. Yeah, so, um, you know, professionally, my background is as a usability uh, engineer. So, um, you know, back when I was studying under uh, some of the great, literally today, even today, very, very well-known usability um, technologists, um, it became very clear to me back in the 80s uh, when I first started in this area that usability and accessibility were, were very closely aligned. In fact, um, I would tell you that, and I think most people will tell you, that accessibility is just another persona or framework within the greater usability science, right? Um, yeah, agreed. And, and, and yet, what I, what, what I always, you know, kind of what I always like to say is usability is nothing without accessibility True. because – We've got what they don't have. We have laws that mandate access to people with disabilities. There are no laws. There are standards, but there are no laws that mandate usability. No. So, so without us, they have no stick. All they've well, got is a lot of carrots. Well, I think that, that there's some interest around 508 Refresh because we're trying to get the um, at least a clause in there to say that there must be some method for – um, people with cognitive disabilities to be able yeah. to use. Uh, and I think that's really, really massively important for, for maybe that's, that's the missing link, if you will, um, in terms of usability getting that, that kind of leverage, um, that, that we currently have with the technical accessibility element. Yeah, that's an excellent point. A lot of people are not aware that in fact, in the U.S., the Telecommunications Act Section 255 actually talks about usability in its first instance. That's where it reared its its uh, head, so to speak. But we made it, uh, Jim Tobias and myself as co-chairs, along with uh, several of our colleagues on that commission, advisory council, made usability and cognition accessibility two of the key principles uh, with, with, within that, um, within that organization. So we definitely address usability. We felt that the research around cognition and accessibility, especially in, in high tech systems and environments needed a lot of work. We have perhaps one of the greatest minds in the world working on this on our behalf, Clayton Lewis, by the way, at the university of Colorado at Boulder, where we just talked about referred to, and Clayton and I go back a long way because we're both from Connecticut. We both went to the same high school, just different generations. So there's even that kind of tie there. <laughs> but I, I think you will see significant advances in the cognition field as a result of work that he's doing, as a result of work that's going on in the task force as well. And, um, you know, my prediction is that within the next five years, we, we will see um, 
definite advancements. Definite. Excellent. Um, I think we've reached the end of our, our allotted time, so thank you very much, Mike. It's been fascinating. Could talk for longer. Um, forgive the, the sort of tapping sounds. That's my dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they hide under my desk. So thank you very much once again. I uh, hope you have a great conference. Um, yes. Look forward to um, having you on, on the Twitter chat tomorrow night. It's, it's been really good. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Neil. Thank you, thank you Antonio. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, and Deborah as well. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.